Think of this video as a sort of companion piece to a previous video discussing whether Israel was committing genocide. In that video, I mentioned case law in which culpable acts, acts that are crimes against humanity or are war crimes, are used to infer genocidal intent and how, among other crimes, Israel's indiscriminate bombing campaign of Gaza was a culpable act. Now, I feel like I covered the genocide legal issue in detail. Obviously, there might be more that I want to discuss. But here, I wanted to discuss why exactly Israel cannot in fact blow up hospitals or pancake apartment buildings with people still inside them. To do that, I am once again going to look into the law. Wars. Unfortunately, they happen and statistically, the number of wars has been increasing. Thus, it's more important than ever that people begin to understand that in war, you can't just do whatever you want and you need to conform to some standards. Here is where international law comes in and someone tells me that it's useless and we shouldn't care about it, blah, 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 blah. I get it, fine. Now, I know people sometimes get skeptical of international law, but in my view, everyone wants to bomb a hospital, but no one wants their hospital to be bombed. Most of us are civilians, and it seems weird that we would not want to enforce or push a standard that would protect people like us. At the same time, often wars need to be fought, and the right to engage in hostilities during a war is also entrenched in international law. Ultimately, I am saying that there needs to be a balance in fighting the enemy and protecting civilians. And personally, if you are okay with civilians being unprotected in war, I kind of just think your opinion doesn't matter. That being said, what does the law say about launching attacks against civilians? Basically, there are two types of attacks that are illegal under international law, attacks that directly target civilians and attacks that include a military target, but which carry with them a civilian casualty rate that is disproportionate to the expected military gain. All crimes have a mental component as well, but here, unlike with genocide, the level of requisite intent is lower. All you need to do to show that an army intended to attack civilians is to show they purposely launched an attack in order to kill civilians, knowingly launched an attack knowing they would be killing civilians, or acted recklessly in targeting civilians. Attacks where civilians are the target are expressly forbidden. Article 51, Section 2 of the Additional Protocol, Number 1, says... The civilian population as such, as well as individual civilians, shall not be the object of attack, and that acts or threats of violence, the primary purpose of which is to spread terror among the civilian population, are prohibited. Civilians here are described negatively as people who have not taken up arms. Notably, Article 50, Section 3 very specifically says, the presence within the civilian population of individuals who do not come within the definition of civilians does not deprive the population of its civilian character. Even objects can be considered civilian as Article 52 states very clearly that Civilian objects shall not be the object of attack or reprisal. Civilian objects are all objects which are not military objectives. Non-civilian objects are those which, by their nature, location, purpose, or use, make an effective contribution to military action, and whose total or partial destruction, capture, or neutralization, in the circumstances ruling at the time, offers a definite military advantage. And lastly, in case of doubt whether an object which is normally dedicated to civilian purposes, such as a place of worship, a house, or other dwelling, or a school, is being used to make an effective contribution to military action, it shall be presumed not to be so used. The case law helps clear up some questions about the gray areas of what it means to target civilians. For example, direct attacks can be inferred from the indiscriminate character of the weapon used, and you are entitled to determine it by a case-by-case -case basis that the indiscriminate character of an attack can assist it in determining whether the attack was directed against the civilian population. 
you can also use a case-by-case -case basis to infer that certain attacks that are disproportionate are also ones that are targeting civilians directly, where you consider, in Teralia, the distance between the source of the fire and the victim. In terms of intent, all you need to prove is that the perpetrator targeted civilians willfully or recklessly. Attacks where civilians are killed in the course of hitting a military target are prohibited in certain circumstances. Generally speaking, this is based on a proportionality calculation. These are indiscriminate attacks which, as Article 51, Section 5b of the Additional Protocol No. 1 puts it, are attacks which may be expected to cause incidental loss of civilian life, injury to civilians, damage to civilian objects, or a combination thereof which would be excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated. Naturally, this leaves a lot of questions. How do you calculate an expected loss of inter alia civilian life? How much of that would be excessive, and how can someone even anticipate a direct military advantage from an attack? These rules don't give a specific number of anything more specific than this, so here is where we delve into the case law. In the trials of our old friend Karadzik, along with his pals, we find case law which helps answer these questions. Whether a military advantage could have been achieved from an attack requires an assessment of whether it was reasonable to believe, in the circumstances of the persons contemplating the attack, including the information available to the latter, that the object was being used to make an effective contribution to military action. The relevant question is whether the attackers could have reasonably believed that the target was a legitimate military objective, and a useful standard by which to assess the reasonableness of such belief is that of the reasonable commander in the position of the attackers. So, basically, the expected losses and the anticipated military gain need to be calculated based on what a reasonable commander could gleam in that scenario and with the information that they had at the time. However, courts can determine what a reasonable commander could expect by including evidence of victim witnesses and military observers. Attacks which were held to be indiscriminate even though they included valid military targets included the following. An attack on an old bridge which was being used by the Bosnian army, a valid military target, was disproportionate because the damage it caused to civilians included a psychological impact and it totally isolated the village so that food and medical supplies could not enter. A shelling attack on Bosnian soldiers during a soccer game where seven militants were killed for five civilians. This was called an indiscriminate attack since Based on the information available to the Republika Srpska forces, they would have known they'd be killing the civilians. Now, a 7 to 5 militant to civilian ratio isn't the be-all and end-all for determining whether a strike is legal or not. Naturally, a holistic analysis must be made of all of the surrounding factors around the strike. However, Attacking a valid military target that is intermingled with civilian targets in a densely populated civilian area is not enough of a factor to argue that a strike isn't indiscriminate. The only strong exception to these protections is if a civilian takes up arms or if the attack can be found to be proportionate. Otherwise, and this is pretty clear across the board, a party accused of indiscriminately bombing civilians can't point to their opponent's failure in their own duties in war, as is stated in Article 51, Section 8. Any violation of these prohibitions shall not release the parties to the conflict from their legal obligations with respect to the civilian population and civilians including the obligation to take the precautionary measures provided for in Article 57. And in Article 57, which discusses the need to take precautions, and which states that regardless of what precaution a party takes, that no provision of this article may be construed as authorizing any attacks against the civilian population, civilians, or civilian objects. Evidence suggests that Israel both directly targeted civilians and civilian targets and indiscriminately targeted civilians during its campaign in Gaza.
As of writing this, the Gazan Ministry of Health has reported that 29,514 Gazans are dead and 69,616 are injured as a result of Israel's assault on Gaza. This estimation is rather conservative, however, as it does not count the number missing under the rubble and presumed dead. Around 8,000 people are presumed dead, which make this number closer to 40,000 dead as opposed to 30,000 right now, especially by the time this video is released. Overall, the Gazan Health Ministry statistics are the most reliable numbers we have on the death toll. Something which Israeli officials have even confirmed, saying, The Ministry of Health in Gaza is more reliable than the IDF because the IDF does not have direct access to information regarding the civilians it has killed. They, the Ministry of Health in Gaza, are not always accurate, but this is the best there is. A question I'd like to answer here is, how many of these deaths are civilians and how many are fighters? Well, if you listen to the IDF's official numbers, the number of fighters is 12,000, while Hamas says the number is closer to 6,000. Hamas's number is more consistent with what independent investigators have put out, and Israeli officials have anonymously admitted they don't really have any idea how many people have been killed in each strike unless it has targeted a major Hamas commander. Around 6,000 is as accurate of a death toll that we can consider as of now. On October 19th, the IDF struck the St. Porphyrius Greek Orthodox Church compound in Gaza City. The strike killed 18 civilians and injured 12, according to a church official. We don't know why this bombardment was launched against our church. Nobody has provided any explanation for causing such a tragedy. This is a church, a place of peace and love and prayer. There is no safety anywhere in Gaza at present. The Israelis released a video of the bombing attack and a statement saying that there was a Hamas command center nearby. The IDF later deleted that video and no evidence has been provided to substantiate their claims. Church officials publicly stated that people were using their compound for refuge well before the strike. On October 20th, the IDF struck the El Nusayrot refugee camp. The strike killed 28 civilians, including 12 children. This camp was in central Gaza, an area which the Israeli army ordered residents of northern Gaza to move to for their safety. Haytham Abu Shahada, one of the survivors, lost his wife and three daughters in the strike. He moved to the area in order to be safe, saying, I will live with that guilt for the rest of my life. It was I who suggested that they move there temporarily. I wish I did not do that. I wish I could turn the clock back. I'd rather we all died together than losing my family. No evidence was provided for a military target in the area. Other strikes in safe zones, areas the IDF knew civilians would be congregating, include the October 10th Khan Yunus bombing, the October 11th Rafa bombing, the October 19th bombing of Khan Yunus, and the central Gaza bombings that took place on the 17th, 18th, and 25th of October. The October 10th strike killed 20, and the October 19th strike killed 12 and occurred near a hospital. On December 13th, eyewitness reports emerged claiming that the IDF shot and killed 15 people, including children in the Shadia Burzala school. People were using the school in order to shelter from the bombing. Eyewitnesses said that the IDF killed them in point-blank executions. On December 12th, the Israelis struck the Harb family building, where 25 civilians were killed, including 10 children. Islam Harb, a survivor, said they were given no warning of the strike and that his family had no idea why their house was targeted. Amnesty International, after visiting the site, found no evidence of a legitimate military target. On December 14th, the Shahada family was struck with Israel killing 30 civilians, including 11 children and 11 women. Amnesty found no evidence of a military target. On December 19th, the Zurab family was struck. 22 civilians were killed, including 11 children. Amnesty found no evidence of a military target. On January 9th, the Nufal family was struck. 18 civilians were killed, including 10 children. 
Amnesty found no evidence of a military target. On January 24th, a group of five were shot at by the IDF, holding a white flag. One was killed. All of this occurred in a safe zone. In another morbid shooting on January 26th, a woman and her grandson were waving a white flag. The grandmother was shot by the IDF. On January 29th to February 10th, the Hind Rajab shooting took place. Six people killed, along with two medics sent to find them and give them aid. The event happened in broad daylight. The ambulance in the car showed there were civilians, and the Red Crescent said that they coordinated the movement of the ambulance with the IDF. On February 29th, in one of the latest and most publicized massacres in Gaza, the IDF shot at Gazans scrambling to get food from aid convoys. Eyewitnesses describe being shot at by the IDF. The death toll has reached 118 and the number of wounded is less than 800. On October 31st, Israel struck the Jabalia refugee camp, killing at least 50 people to allegedly target a Hamas commander. Hamas, for its part, denied that the commander was even there. On December 18th and across the preceding weekend, the Israelis killed at least 110 people in strikes on the Jebeliyah refugee camp to target what it claims to have been Hamas's infrastructure. Killing over a hundred people to allegedly target infrastructure is clearly a disproportionate attack. On December 23rd, two homes were bombed by the Israeli Air Force, killing over 90 people. 76 members of the extended Mughrabi family were slaughtered in these strikes. A tweet from Israel at the time alleges that a cell of militants were present at the time, but no evidence is given and the number of militants is not given at all. On January 4th, the Israelis struck another building in a safe zone, killing 12 people, including 10 children, the youngest of which was the age of five. The Israelis alleged that fighters had hidden, past tense, or that there was Hamas infrastructure in the area. No militants were reported to be killed in this strike. Any of these strikes are grounds for serious allegations of war crimes and targeting civilians and thus must be investigated. So just like my previous video, this is just me Scratching the surface of what is out there, Israel has launched thousands of strikes, killing thousands of people, and naturally it is well out of my ability to analyze each and every strike. In this video though, I used a wider sample size of strikes in order to illustrate as definitively as possible that Israel has targeted civilians and thus committed a war crime or culpable act. I've been thinking a lot lately about whatever role I must have as a Palestinian YouTuber talking about this very awful violence against my people. It's very weird to have what I, at the moment, consider a hobby be used to discuss these kinds of important things, because I really have no idea if this stuff has any real impact, and if so, I should take my work seriously here or not. Um, that being said, I hope people enjoyed the video and that I at least imprinted the idea that I was going for here. If you want to help me pursue this interest and make more videos like this, as well as aid my escape from an environment sucking the soul out of my body, consider becoming a patron. I'd really appreciate it. Maybe I'd be able to post more than once every two months too. Who knows? Anything's possible. Once again, a big thank you to all of my patrons who have had such immense patience with me as I've really struggled to get this video out. Um, I had to delay it by, I think, two weeks. So, you know, uh, my patrons are you know the real troopers here. Uh, all $7 and up patrons uh, get their name shouted out at the end of the video. So once again, thank you to Avocado Kirby, Khazikani, Rod B, and Pyrotic Napalm. If you'd like to help the channel without being a patron, please like, share, uh, subscribe to this channel, and comment. Thank you very much.